We all have to obey the laws of the universe, whether we like it or not. But what exactly are those laws? They can be a bit complicated to explain, and not all of them are completely understood. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. In this episode of Perspectives, several experts share what we do and do not know about the strange laws of physics that govern our universe. We begin now with an example of just how counterintuitive these laws can be. Enjoy. Everything in the universe obeys the laws of physics. So you'd think the laws would be pretty obvious. You want to know the laws of motion? Just look around, see how things are moving. But of course, that's not how it works. The laws of motion are not obvious or intuitive. They need to be learned with difficulty in school. And they needed to be discovered through careful experiments and insightful reasoning. For example, Newton's first law of motion says an object in motion will keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed, forever, unless acted upon by an outside force. But when you throw a ball, it doesn't go in a straight line. It goes up and falls down. When you push on a wagon, it doesn't keep rolling forever. It slows to a stop. It takes a lot of work to keep something moving in a straight line at a constant speed. One reason is that we live on a planet where there's always an outside force, namely the Earth's gravitational pull. Even worse, we're embedded in a fluid, air, that resists the motion of objects. And there's friction between any two surfaces, like a wagon wheel on the ground. So it takes real imagination to figure out what would happen if there were no air resistance and no friction. Isaac Newton developed a simple theory. Four basic laws. Three laws of motion and the law of universal gravitation. Newton's first law of motion concerns any object that has no force applied to it. An object not subject to an external force will continue in its state of motion at a constant speed in a straight line. Now, suppose I'm on ice skates, right? I'm just standing in the middle of the rink. What's going to happen? I'll stay in the middle of the rink. But if I'm on ice skates and moving forward at two miles an hour, I will continue to move straight ahead at two miles an hour until something pushes me or stops me. So the first law describes the behavior of an object subjected to no external force. The second then describes the behavior of an object that is subjected to an external force. So again, if I'm on ice skates moving forward at two miles an hour and you push me from behind, I now go faster in the same direction. If you pull me from behind, I slow down. If you body check me from the side, I change direction. The bigger the push, the more the change. The heavier the object, the less the change. So, an object is either subject to a force or it isn't. So the first two laws are sufficient to describe its behavior. But what about the thing that applied the force? What happens to it? The force I feel from you is felt by you in the opposite direction, but in the same amount, right? Again, if I'm on ice skates and you push me, I accelerate forward because of the force and you go backwards because of it. If you body check me from the side, I change direction and you go the opposite way, to the penalty box. To every action, there's always an equal but opposite reaction. These three simple laws explained a lot but they become incredibly powerful when combined with the fourth law, the law of universal gravitation, which says that gravitation is an attractive force, a very attractive force, the, the Marilyn Monroe of physical forces. Take any objects with mass, and there will be an attraction between them along the lines connecting their centers of mass. This pull will be proportional to the product of their masses. Make one twice as heavy, twice the attraction and it will be inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Move them twice as far away, feel only one-fourth the pull. How did Newton or anybody ever figure that stuff out? Well, in physics class, we learn by watching carefully contrived physics demonstrations. We watch plastic discs slide across an air hockey table with very little friction. 
we pump all the air out of a chamber to show that a bowling ball and a feather fall with the same acceleration. Well, Mother Nature provides us with a physics demonstration that's visible to everyone all the time. I'm talking about the motion of the planets in the sky. To the naked eye, the planets of the solar system are points of light that move from night to night relative to the fixed background of stars. In fact, the name planet comes from an ancient Greek word for wanderer because the planets wander through the constellations. And it was this celestial physics demonstration that led Newton to his law of gravity. The planets move in response to the sun's gravity without any friction. And each one is at a different distance from the sun. So by observing them, you can work out how gravity depends on distance. Imagine standing with a friend who is holding a flashlight on a dark night at one end of a long, quiet street. Standing close to the flashlight, it will appear incredibly bright. However, as you walk away from your friend, the flashlight will appear to get dimmer and dimmer. By the time you've reached the other end of the street, you may barely be able to see it at all. This experiment demonstrates a fundamental property of light known as the inverse square law, which states that as we move away from a light source, its apparent intensity, how bright it looks, will decrease in proportion to the square of the distance. In other words, if your distance from the flashlight doubles, its apparent brightness will decrease by a factor of four. If your distance triples, the brightness will decrease by a factor of nine. Now, imagine that you know the flashlight has a 20-watt bulb. If you walk away from the flashlight and use a scientific instrument that can measure how bright the light is, you could use that apparent brightness your knowledge of the bulb's wattage, and the inverse square law to calculate how far you've walked. In astronomy, a light source like this, with a known luminosity, is known as a standard candle. If we have a way of determining the actual luminosity we expect from the object, we can compare that to the apparent brightness that we see and measure its distance. This technique is particularly valuable when studying very distant objects. Eventually, the effects of parallax stop working because things get too far away. If you try the left eye, right eye trick with a distant building or trees on the horizon, odds are you won't see it move at all. However, since a standard candle depends on the inverse square law, it can reach much further as a result. As long as we have instruments that can detect a standard candle and measure its brightness, it can be used to measure a distance. For bright stars like Cepheids, the Levitt law meant that if we could measure a Cepheids variation period, we could infer its true luminosity. We could then compare that to its apparent brightness and use the inverse square law to calculate how far away it was giving us unprecedented reach when it came to measuring the distances of stars. Now, you may remember conservation laws from a high school physics class, but the basic idea is that something is conserved if it doesn't change. For instance, in chemistry, an important conservation law is conservation of mass. If you mix chemicals, say a quantity of hydrogen and a second quantity of oxygen to make water, the mass of the gaseous ingredients and the final liquid water are identical. What has happened is that the ingredients have moved around and been combined in different ways, but no mass was created or destroyed. In physics, you may have heard of the laws of conservation of energy, momentum, and charge. And this is a really subtle and crucial point. The symmetry is in the laws of the universe, not the universe itself. I mean, if you walked over to your neighbor's house to chat over a beer or a nice pot of tea, you'll clearly have changed your location. I mean, you won't be in your house anymore. It will be obvious that you moved. However, the question is, are the laws of physics identical in both locations? Would a struck bell sound the same? Would a cake bake equally well? Would a ball fall a fixed distance in the same amount of time? Those are the kind of things I mean when I say that you make a change and nothing changes in the laws of physics. 
So how are these familiar conservation laws tied into the symmetries of the cosmos? Well, let's start with the position of an object. If we can move the position of an object without the laws of the universe changing, what conservation law does that lead to? It leads to the conservation of linear momentum. That's right, that kind of odd quantity you might have encountered in a physics class, momentum, which equals the mass times the velocity of an object, is always the same. That's why you used it in problems when you had two balls of different masses and velocities hitting one another and changing directions and speeds. The momentum before and after the collision is unchanged, and now you know that this arises from the fact that the laws of motion are independent of where you do the experiment. Another symmetry of the laws of nature are that they are unchanged if we change what we define as day zero. The Gregorian calendar defines the first day as just a bit over two millennia ago. Suppose we define the second at which the clock struck midnight on the night that split 1999 and the year 2000 as moment zero. If the laws of physics looked at that shift in time and yawned and went back to sleep unchanged, then that means that the laws of physics are symmetric under shifts in time. The corresponding conservation law is the law of conservation of energy. So the first big idea in thermodynamics is the familiar idea of energy. Every separate part of the universe, we, we, we call that a system, has a certain energy content, which we denote by E. The, the physics unit of energy is the joule. Roughly speaking, uh, that's the energy of motion that a baseball acquires if you drop it a couple of feet. Energy can change forms and be transferred from one system to another, but the total amount of it remains constant. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's conserved. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Systems can exchange energy, and this happens in two distinct ways. The first way is called work, W. This is energy transfer that is associated with a, a force acting through a distance, like the force of gravity acting on the baseball after you drop it. Less obviously, work is also done when you charge up an electric battery or when a, a material becomes magnetized. It's all work. The second way that energy is transferred is called heat. That's Q. If you put two bodies at different temperatures next to each other, there is a heat flow from the hotter one to the colder one. That, that, that energy transfer isn't work, since the objects are not exerting forces or being moved. That's heat flow. And, and according to the first law, a system's energy cannot just go up or down on its own. There must be some kind of energy transfer to or from the system. So the total change in the system's energy, delta E, is just the heat plus the work, Q plus W. And we should notice here that Q and W could each be positive or negative, depending on whether the energy is flowing into or out of the system. Now, as far as the first law is concerned, any sort of energy transformation or exchange is fine. It does not matter, for instance, whether heat flows from hot to cold or cold to hot. Either way obeys the law. But in the real world, heat only flows from hot to cold and never the reverse. Or, or, or take another example. Uh, uh, we can always transform work into heat. If I, if I rub my hands together, they warm up. Friction turns muscular work into heat. The, the reverse is not always possible. We, we cannot always turn heat into work. Now, now, we can do that to some extent. That's how a steam engine works. Um, uh, uh, heat from a fire boils water, and the steam pushes a piston. But not all of the heat is turned into work. Some of it is released into the cooler surroundings as waste heat. And, and try as we might, we cannot build an engine that turns heat into work with 100% efficiency. So there is another principle at work besides the first law. And that's exactly what the German physicist Rudolf Clausius discovered in the mid-19th century, the second law of thermodynamics. And to express his new law, Clausius introduced a strange new quantity called entropy, S. The word derives from the Greek word tropos, meaning transformation. So, so what is this mysterious 
entropy. It's a property of a system, like its mass or its energy content. S can, can change as the system undergoes changes. It may increase or decrease, and entropy moves from one system to another when heat is transferred. Clausius's second law says that the total entropy can never decrease. Total S can stay the same, or it can go up, but it can never go down. Put even more simply, the universe is always becoming more random. Any homeowner can attest to this simple principle. Just like the house of cards, a wall, or a mountain, if left to reach its own lowest energy state, a house will eventually crumble into a disordered pile of rubble. So how do we prevent this change? Well, significant energy must be put in by the homeowner to keep the system in its desired macro state. This is because there are far more microstates consistent with that unattractive pile of rubble than there are with a beautiful home. So every time you clean the kitchen, patch the roof, or mow the lawn, you are fighting entropy. It's a battle that you can continue indefinitely, as long as you have an external source of energy. In this case, that source is you. This is particularly disconcerting from a cosmological perspective since cosmologists often think about the entire universe as one gigantic, closed system. If we think in this way, Boltzmann's equation and the second law of thermodynamics make a dire prediction. That the overall randomness of matter in the universe will constantly increase until it simply can't anymore. Since, in theory, there's nothing outside of the universe to act as a source of energy input, we're doomed by the second law of thermodynamics. This manner of thinking leads to the prediction that someday, the universe will become completely randomized, a slave to the second law of thermodynamics. Its entropy will continue to grow and grow until the whole of the universe is one single uniform temperature. At this point, there will be no available energy left to power life, planetary processes, or even the vast engines of stars. Cosmologists call this phenomenon heat death. And if it's our destiny, then the only consolation is that it's going to take the universe billions and billions of years to get there. In recent decades, physicists once again have become interested in theories that could potentially combine and unify multiple facets of nature. In spirit, these modern theories have a lot in common with Einstein's dream of unified field theory. But in other ways, they are really very different. For one thing, many important discoveries have been made since Einstein's death. And these discoveries have significantly changed how physicists view the prospect of building a unified field theory. In particular, whereas Einstein was focused on electromagnetism and gravity, physicists have since discovered two new forces that exist in nature as well, the weak and strong nuclear forces. The strong nuclear force is a force that holds protons and neutrons together within the nuclei of atoms. And the weak nuclear force is responsible for certain radioactive decays and for the process of nuclear fission. It turns out that electromagnetism has a lot in common with these strong and weak nuclear forces. And it's not particularly hard, at least in principle, to construct theories in which these three phenomena are unified into a single framework. Such theories are known as grand unified theories, or GUTs for short. And since they were first studied in the 1970s, a number of different grand unified theories have been proposed. Grand unified theories are incredibly powerful, and in principle they can predict and explain a huge range of phenomena. But they are also very hard to test and explore experimentally. It's not that these theories are untestable in principle. If you could build a big enough particle accelerator, you could almost certainly find out exactly how these three forces fit together into a single unified field theory. But even grand unified theories are not as far reaching as the kinds of unified field theories that Einstein spent so much of his life and career searching for. Grand unified theories bring together electromagnetism with the strong and weak forces. They don't connect these phenomena with general relativity. But much like Einstein, modern physicists are also looking for theories that can combine general relativity with the other forces of nature. We hope that such a theory could unify all four of the known forces, including gravity. And since the aim of such a theory is to describe all of the laws of physics that describe our universe, we call a theory of this kind a theory of everything. I sometimes wonder what Einstein would think about our modern investigations into grand unified theories and theories of everything. In many ways, these modern theories have very little in common with those explored by Einstein during his lifetime. But in spirit, they're really trying to answer the same kinds of questions. 
At their foundations, they are each trying to explain as much about our world as possible, as simply as they possibly can. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.